The phrase Twilight Zone-esque gets thrown around a lot when describing sci-fi and horror films, which not only speaks to the timelessness of Rod Serling's seminal series, but speaks to there being more than just what is unfolding on screen that is truly notable about these works. While anyone even remotely interested in genre stories can recall a handful of Twilight Zone episodes based on particular moments, intertwined into each and every one of them is a rich layer of social commentary that was at the heart of Serling's work. But this balance of commentary and diverse otherworldly storytelling eludes many works that on the surface seem Twilight Zone-esque. Vivarium is such a film that falls into this subgenre, but does its association hold water? Currently streaming on Prime Video, Vivarium is written and directed by Lorcan Finnegan, the director behind 2016's Without Name. Finnegan pairs once again with Garrett Shanley, delivering an intriguing sci-fi horror premise that captivates from its outset. Starring Imogen Poots and Jesse Eisenberg as Gemma and Tom, a couple looking to buy their starter home. After meeting with a outgoing real estate agent, they follow him to a perfect picture cul-de-sac. When they enter home number nine, it's fully furnished in the perfect starter home for a couple planning for a child in the future. As Gemma and Tom inspect the home's backyard, the real estate agent disappears, seemingly abandoning them in this new neighborhood. I mean, when I said he seemed weird, that being a capital W-E-I-R-D weird, I meant it. But even this seems overly strange. Gemma and Tom realize that the realtor has abandoned them at the property, and they return to their car to drive home, annoyed and a little more than perturbed. Though, as they continue to drive down the rows and rows of identical houses, they notice that they've driven in a circle as they end up back at number 9. As they convince themselves that they simply missed their turn, they continue to drive around the neighborhood again and again and again and again eh, until their car runs out of gas and they end back where they started, right at property number 9. They've seemingly found themselves in a loop of which they cannot escape from. The initial draw of Vivarium is its supernatural mystery of why they're there, is there a way out, and is there something more nefarious afoot. Boxes of food are delivered daily, but they never see the people delivering them. There are other houses in the neighborhood, but is anyone else living there? As frustrations and fright consume them, the couple's relationship becomes further strained. And then a baby in a box shows up. Now, Gemma and Tom are forced into becoming surrogate parents who must contend with raising an otherworldly child on top of being stuck in this suburban hellscape. The first half of Vivarium is tense and engaging as Lorcan and Shanley do a quality job of presenting the film's otherworldly setting, blending a seemingly mundane neighborhood into a terrifying trap. Several scenes that display the endlessness of the neighborhood, such as Gemma and Tom walking until they collapse, only to see a light on in a house supposedly miles away from their own, only to run inside and find themselves standing back in their own kitchen at house number 9. Or the moment when Tom climbs onto the roof and sees rows and rows and rows of homes extending as far as the eye can see. It's creepy and unsettling and really does its Twilight Zone-esque moniker justice. It's just that the metaphor, and eventually the progress of the story, really falls off for me quite steeply. It's at this point that the film's title truly spells out why this is happening to Gemma and Tom. As, a vivarium is an enclosure, container, or structure, adapted or prepared for keeping animals under semi-natural conditions for observation, or study, or as pets. With this definition in mind, we proceed into the film's overtly sci-fi elements of the raising of their newfound baby. Shockingly, the child has grown years in a matter of months. It has no original thoughts or sentences, as it simply mimics Gemma and Tom's movements, hilariously displayed when they flip him off as he wakes him up by screaming incessantly. And scream he will, as the child opts to scream until it's attended with either food or company, though no actual emotional relationship is formed between surrogate parents and child, as their relationship is purely needs-based. This infuriates Tom and Gemma, more so Tom, whose grasp on his own mental fortitude wanes considerably. This causes a rift between Gemma and Tom, who have now been in the time loop for an unidentifiable amount of time. They never have to worry about food, never have to worry about work, they just have to raise the child under the guise that if they do so, they will be freed. But when that will be is too great of a challenge to their collective sanity. Here's where the film begins to drag considerably for me, and what it reveals about the inner workings of Vivarium's world just aren't nearly as engaging as the mystery it's all shrouded in. Essentially, Gemma and Tom are in a terrarium, with a non-human child who they must raise to be human. Well, as human as a, for lack of a better word, alien child can be. The maturity phase of raising the child and him mimicking Gemma and Tom or screaming incessantly at them grows a tad unbearable due to how long the film sticks on this particular beat. The mystery itself also is never fully explained, which is fine as there are enough breadcrumbs that we can infer on our own explanation for these strange events. Eventually the child becomes a full-grown man, yet continues to monitor the couple to continue to learn from them. Now at this point in the film, Tom has become ill, and Gemma decides to do something about leaving the cul-de-sac once and for all, and attacks the now fully formed surrogate son. 
This is the most engaging sequence of the final act, though it is very short-lived. Attacking her alien son forces him to reveal his alien nature and exposes the secrets hiding behind the curtain, as it were. This segment is incredibly vibrant and dreamlike, presenting a new level to the couple's nightmare. Gemma is presented with a new, neon nightmare, one which causes her to become equal parts terrified and confused by what she learns about their predicament. And then the film suddenly wraps, just as it presents the first engaging advancement its narrative has had in nearly 30 minutes. Given that the film is a mere 97 minutes long, Vivarium's narrative does little outside of what you'd expect it to, with the exception of its conclusion. My other grievance with the film is that it isn't shy about bludgeoning the viewer over the head with its overarching metaphor. I won't delve too much into fear of excessive spoilers, but it is plainly apparent from the jump, and to be honest, just exposes how the mystery shrouding the entire thing is far more interesting than what the film is trying to convey. As far as performances go, Imugen Poots is the driving force that stopped me from hating Vivarium's low points. In the face of this nightmare, she remains true to herself and her unwavering dedication to overcoming this hell, her and Tom have become stuck in. As for Jesse Eisenberg, he did little for me, given he is pretty charm and humorless in this. He becomes a sub-antagonist almost at a certain point in the film, further making him unlikable, though Poots sticking by him and continuing to uncover the mystery of their predicament gives life to an otherwise fairly uninvolving middle act. Calling Vivarium Twilight Zone-esque remains valid, given its blending of both sci-fi time loop and otherworldly horror of the character's captors. The mystery of this time loop and trying to discover who is behind it all definitely drives the core of the film, and to be fair, the initial build-up drew me in. It's just the second half of the film comes to a standstill between a one-note padding of character interactions as well as the metaphor tying it all together, being dullfully plain. And as a result, there's no aha moment. I mean, it's by no means terrible, but fairly underwhelming for how well it begins. I'd say you should feel comfortable selling this to others as Twilight Zone-esque, even if its narrative doesn't come close to being as timeless as that. Entertaining, but don't set your expectations too high. And that'll do it for another episode of Daily Horror Habit, and I'll see you guys soon for another Daily Horror Movie Review.